Thank you very much for inviting me here. Uh, we've had a great time. This is a wonderful place, and uh, it's been a great visit so far. And today I want to tell you a bit about what the universe is made of. Um, this is a really fun time to be working in cosmology because there's a lot of information coming in and we're learning a lot about the universe. Um, when I got started in the early 1980s, um, my roommates in graduate school made fun of me because cosmology was such a, a speculative subject. Um, it was kind of like an inverted pyramid with a little bit of fact at the bottom and a lot of theories at the top. And, uh, but it was more fun because you could pretty much publish a, a paper that said almost anything and nobody could prove you wrong. Um, what has changed over the last few years and what I want to talk about tonight is that we've really developed a, a much better understanding of um, what the universe is made of. Um, is this, oh, there we are. Um, and what's odd about it is that it's, um, sorry about the, uh, it's weirder than we really could have possibly imagined. So although we have a much clearer idea of what we're talking about these days, um, the results that we've come up with have been, uh, frankly, kind of astonishing to those of us who've been working in this field for a very long time. So basically, our picture of the universe that we believe in today, this little pie chart of the universe, about 5% of the universe is uh, just ordinary matter. So it's, um, it's, it's the stuff that we're made of, protons and neutrons and nuclei. Uh, about 25% is made out of something rather mysterious and weird called dark matter, and I'll talk about dark matter tonight and what its properties are. And then about 70% is made of an even more bizarre substance called dark energy. Now, um, they, uh, great uh, bizarre claims require great evidence. I think that's from the Spider-Man movie, something like that. So what I want to do is try to convince you why anybody would actually believe this. Why would anyone believe this? Let's go find out. All right, so the story starts with this character that I'm sure no one is, of you have ever heard of. His name was Vesto Slifer. How many of you have heard of him? Nobody's heard of him, poor guy. He's been forgotten, and that's why he's so unhappy looking there. Um, he was measuring around the turn of the century, the turn of the, I have to say the turn of the last century now, I'm so old, but I used to say the turn of the century, the 1910s and around the time of World War I, he was measuring the velocities of nearby galaxies. So here's some pictures of galaxies. Um, now his, he had a, a, a much worse telescope than we have today, so what he was seeing were not beautiful pictures like this, but little blobs in his telescope. And in fact, back then, people didn't even know whether these objects were galaxies like our own, outside our own galaxy, or just gas clouds floating around inside our galaxy. And what he was doing was measuring how fast these galaxies were moving, and he figured, well, some would be moving toward us, and some would be moving away, and he would figure out kind of what the, the average speed is relative to ourselves, and, and what our motion relative to the galaxies looked like. And he was using something called the Doppler effect. So this is a very famous effect. You can uh, hear it, even if you can't see it. Um, if you have a train that's coming toward you, the sound waves get squished as they move toward you, and they go to shorter wavelengths, which represents a higher pitch. So the train whistle goes up as it goes toward you, like whoop. And then as it moves away from you, it goes down. Now, all these uh, theories were developed by Europeans, and so they're always talking about trains, and none of us have ever been on a train. But you can get the same effect from a police siren, which is a more American thing. So you get the, you get the, 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 this pitch goes up as it comes toward you, and it goes down as it moves away from you. Now, what about light? Well, light should do the same thing. So short wavelengths of light are blue light, and long wavelengths are red light. So as I move toward you, you see me turning blue, right? And as I move away from you, I turn red. Does everybody see that? You do see that, right? Blue, red. Well, you don't see that. And the reason you don't see that is because I'm moving much slower relative to the speed of light. Sound really doesn't move all that fast. It goes about 700 miles an hour. So when you're driving down the highway, you're going at about Mach 0.1. You probably never thought of it that way. But you're going at a tenth of the speed of sound. You're going pretty fast. So in our everyday life, we can move pretty fast relative to sound. But light moves at 186,000 miles per second. There's no way we're going to get anywhere near that speed. And you're not going to see the Doppler effect, except in very special laboratory settings. 
or in space. So in fact, what Slypho, Slypho was doing was looking at the shift of light as these galaxies were moving toward us and away from us, and he made a rather astonishing discovery. What he discovered was that they were almost all moving, that's my, I have some PowerPoint animations, you have to forgive me for those. Um, they were all moving away from us, and some, not all of them, but almost all of them were moving away from us at very high velocities. So what Slypher had actually discovered was the expansion of the universe, which probably should have been named after him, but it didn't get named after him, it got named after that guy, who I think everyone, has anyone heard of Edwin Hubble? Yes, we all have, and they named a telescope after him, he's insanely famous. So how come he gets all the credit for it? Well, he made an even more fundamental discovery. What he did was not just measure how fast the galaxies were moving, but how far away they are. And that's a very difficult measurement. Now, I'm going to talk about easy measurements and difficult measurements here because I'm a theorist and I never have to make any measurements. And so, uh, you know, to me, some things look hard and some things look easy. This is a difficult measurement. And the easy way to measure things is by their brightness. So imagine you're sitting at the end of a football field and someone has a whole bunch of lamps set up along the football field at the 50 yard line and the 10 yard line and the 90 yard line, you would expect that the dimmer lights would be farther away and the brighter lights would be closer. And that would be true if they were all 100 watt light bulbs. But now suppose I mix together 60 watt light bulbs and 40 watt light bulbs and 100 watt light bulbs. Well, in general, the things that are brighter are gonna be closer to you, but it's also possible for something to be brighter because it's intrinsically brighter and farther away. So a 100 watt light bulb on the 50 yard line is gonna look brighter than a 40 watt, lot, 40 watt light bulb on the 40 yard line. And that's what astronomers have to face. The objects they're looking at all have different brightnesses. So what Hubble had to do was to come up with something we call a standard candle. You can see how old this field is because they're talking about standard candles and not standard light bulbs. Um, he had to find an object which he knew the, the true brightness of and then he could look at its apparent brightness and he could figure out how far away it is. And what he settled on were a class of stars called Cepheid variables. Here's a picture uh, from the Space Telescope, and you can see that little dot there. This is, the, the print's probably too small to read, but it's upper left-hand corner is December 17th, upper right is December 21st, December 30th, and January 26th. And you can see that it gets brighter and dimmer. It's, it starts out little dim, and then it gets a little dimmer, and then it gets brighter, and then it gets very bright, and it's going to get dim again. And what Hubble discovered was that the brightness of the star was related to how fast it pulsates. Things that pulsated faster were intrinsically dimmer, they're like 40 watt light bulbs, and things that pulsated slower were the 100 watt light bulbs. They were the brighter objects. So then he could use that to figure out how far away things were, and he graphed that versus their speed. And this is, in fact, his original graph. Now, if you turn this in in a freshman physics lab, you would not get a very good grade. Because, uh, I mean, it looks like he just said, ah, I know the answer, it has to be a straight line, I'll just draw a line through it. But he, he, he did, in fact, um, and this is published in the pub Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, it's very important. One of the most important papers of the 20th century, in fact. Uh, on the vertical axis, we get the speed. On the horizontal axis, we get the distance. And what he showed was that there's a linear relationship. That is to say, something that's twice as far away from us is moving twice as fast. And something that's three times as far away from us is moving three times as fast. Why is that important? Because that means that space itself is expanding. And here's a little picture of our observer, and he's got a bunch of galaxies there and they have to all expand uniformly if the universe is expanding, and you see the ones that are further away are gonna to have to move a lot faster because that line there goes a lot farther. So as the line flattens, it means it's going faster. As it's, um, as it's steeper here, it's going slower. So the only, if you have a universe which is expanding, the only law that it can obey is Hubble's law. The speed of something has to be proportional to how far away it is from you. Now I'm gonna demonstrate this uh, using my sophisticated balloon um, on which I have drawn little galaxies and I'm going to now expand the balloon and you can see they've kind of faded in fact it's coming off all over my hands but um, 
you can see that the objects which are farther away move faster as you expand the balloon, and the ones that are closer don't move as far. This also shows you something else, which is there's no center to the expansion of the universe. When we sit here, we see that everything is moving away from us, and we're tempted to believe, especially if you're a college professor, that we're the center of the universe, right? But in fact, um, another person, another astronomer sitting in the next galaxy over would see exactly the same thing. Everything would, would look to him or her as though everything was moving away uniformly. So there's no center of the expansion. You can see that on this balloon, each galaxy sees all the other galaxies moving away from it, but there's no center on the surface of the balloon. So um, that was Hubble's inspiration. And at that point, it then became, uh, for about 50 years, cosmology was a bit of a backwater. From about the 1930, not 30, let's say 35 years, from about 1930 to about the mid-60s, cosmologists were obsessed with one question, which is, will the universe expand forever, or will it recollapse and um, fall back, uh, collapse back down to a singularity in the future? So it could expand forever, or it could collapse back down. Now, surprisingly, you've probably done this experiment yourself. I'm going to demonstrate with this ball. If I throw the ball up in the air, it comes back down. I, and that's like a, a recollapsing universe. If I throw it a little harder, it goes higher, but it still comes back down. But if I threw it at about five miles per second, it would not come back down. It would leave the Earth's atmosphere and continue out into space forever. So the thing that pulls it back is the relation between the kinetic energy, how fast it's moving, and the force of gravity. So if the force of gravity is strong enough, the universe will recollapse. If it's not strong enough, the universe will expand forever. So here's an example of the two possible fates. We have, oh, oh that disappeared. Um, why don't we run that again? So this is the expand forever, and that's the recollapse. It's exactly equivalent to throwing a ball up and having it either come back down again or throwing it up and having it leave the Earth's gravitational field entirely. And so how much matter is there in the universe? Well, scientists have developed various ways to measure that. You might say, well, why don't we just look at all the stars out there and see how brightly they're shining and add up the matter from the stars. And you can do that, but then you're going to miss a lot of other matter. You're going to get, there's, there's cold gas out there. There's gas that's not shining. And so there's more matter in the universe than we can even see with the, with the naked eye or with telescopes. And the best, easiest way to measure how much matter there is is something called primordial nucleosynthesis, which is just a long word for making elements in the early universe. Now, most elements are made in stars. So the elements that are in your body, calcium and iron and zinc and all the other stuff, at one time were in the center of a star. They were produced in a star, they got spit out into the, into the interstellar medium, and they condensed on the Earth, and, and then they produced you. But there are a few elements made in the early universe, and the most important of them is helium. Now, this is a very misleading picture I've drawn, I just like the color scheme, because um, if, you know, if you run out to the balloon store tonight and you get a helium balloon and you show it to someone and say, look, I've got a piece of the early universe right in my balloon, that's actually not where our helium comes from. Our helium comes from Texas. And it's, <laughs> and I won't make any comparison of Texas to the early universe. Um, it comes from Texas and it's mined from deep underground deposits. And the reason it's mined from deep underground deposits is that radioactive decay spits helium into these, these pockets of underground, and then you can mine it out again. Helium in our atmosphere long ago disappeared, and you can tell that by releasing a helium balloon. What does it do? It disappears. And it, when it gets high enough up there, the helium escapes, and the helium actually escapes the Earth's gravity. But you can add up how much helium is made in the Big Bang, and it actually is about 25% of all the ordinary matter in the universe, and you can use that to, to estimate how much matter there is, because the more matter there is, the faster the nuclear reactions go in the early universe, and the more, heavy, the more elements you make, the, fa the more helium you make. So by measuring the amount of helium we see in the universe today, we can work backwards and ask how much matter is there. And in fact, ordinary matter only gives you about 5% of what you need to make the universe recollapse. So for many years, especially in the 1970s, after this theory had developed, people said, well, we have about 5% of what we need. The universe is going to expand forever. But that's not the whole story. There's more. 
And the more is actually due to, first to this fellow. His name is Fritz Zwicky, and believe it or not, he discovered dark matter in the 1930s and then was forgotten for 50 years. Zwicky is an interesting character. Um, since this is the, the G-rated version of the talk, I'll tell you one of his famous sayings. He said that um, he, was, he was reported to refer to one of his enemies as a spherical jerk. And the guy said, what did you mean by that? And he said, well, he's a jerk no matter what direction you look at him from. <laughs> so he was a very, as a, I think the, the word they use now is irascible, but you can, you can make up your own words. He was hard to get along with. Um, and I think that may account for one of the reasons he had a bad reputation. But what he was looking at were clusters of galaxies. So these are really beautiful objects. Let me show you an example of one. This is not one of his clusters, but it's a space telescope cluster. These things, that we, you know, we, we talk about things being unimaginable in cosmology, but these really are unimaginably big. So these dots here are not stars. They're individual galaxies. So each of these galaxies has one to 10 billion stars in it. And there are thousands of these galaxies tens of millions of light years across, and yet they're clustered in a little ball. And you can look at how fast the galaxies are moving, and you can say, well, there has to be enough gravity there to keep them from escaping. There has to be enough gravity to keep the cluster together. And then you can calculate how much matter there is. And when Zwicky did that, he discovered there's not enough matter in the galaxies themselves to keep them together, to keep the clusters together. The clusters ought to fly apart. And so he said there has to be something in between the galaxies holding the galaxies together, and he called this dark matter. He said there's dark matter between these galaxies, and that's what's holding them together. And as I said, he published this in the 1930s, and it was ignored for about 40 to 50 years, until it was revived by this woman, Vera Rubin, in the 1970s. What Vera Rubin was looking at was um, how galaxies themselves rotate. And it's a, a similar problem. You can look at how fast things are moving near the edges of galaxies and ask, are they moving, is the galaxy massive enough to keep the thing moving in a circle around the galaxy? And what she discovered was, was quite unexpected. Here's a picture. Um, if you look at galaxies, this is a picture of the Andromeda galaxy, and you go way out to the outskirts of them, the gravitational force decreases as you get farther and farther away, and so the speed of things orbiting them should slow down. Because if they were moving really fast, there's not enough gravity there to keep them moving in a circle. And um, what she discovered instead was that the speed became constant as you move far enough out. Now, I'm going to do a demonstration. I need a volunteer from the audience. Can I pick you? Come on up. All right. And your liability insurance is all paid up, right? Is that OK? So. Um, well, we're going to do a demonstration of dark matter. Um, we've never met before, right? No, OK. Um, we're going to do, I'm going to be the center of the galaxy, and she's going to be a gas cloud, all right? So let me, let me, let me try out here. Whoa! OK. Now, what you notice is that as I spin her faster and faster, thank you very much. All right. You can, you can try this at home, too. As I spin her faster, and I mean just not with this person. As you spin her faster and faster, you have to pull with harder and harder force. It's a well-known phenomenon. We've all done this. And so there has to be enough matter inside the galaxy to keep it moving. Here's another example. Keep it moving uh, in, a, in a circle. And what Vera Rubin postulated is that each galaxy is surrounded by a halo of dark matter. And the halo is not flattened like the galaxy. It's spherical and it extends far beyond the galaxy itself. So here's a picture of uh, a galaxy. It's that disk there. And the dark matter is the blob, the spherical blob that goes way outside from the center of the galaxy. And when you go way outside the galaxy, instead of having just the force from the galaxy holding you together, you also get the force from the dark matter. And that keeps things moving in the at the correct velocity. Now, it's possible to estimate how much dark matter there is. And in fact, ironically, some of our best estimates used to come from galaxy clusters. So people, of course, went back and pulled up Zwicky's original work. And you can use that to estimate how much dark matter there is. Oh, wait, I'm sorry. There's one other. I wanted to show you one other thing here. This is another example which is, has been described as the smoking gun for dark matter. Because you might say, well, OK, maybe our theory of gravity is wrong. Maybe things you know, move the way they do because Einstein's theory breaks down at large distances or small accelerations. 
But this is a picture where you can actually see dark matter directly. What this is a picture of is a two, ga two galaxy clusters actually colliding with each other. And the gas, when that happens, heats up to millions of degrees and gives off x-rays. So you can see where the gas is. And the x-rays are those pink blobs there. So those pink blobs represent the ordinary matter that was in these clusters after they collided. And what happens is they, they pancake. They smash into each other, and they produce a, a, a sort of pancake shape on either side. But you can also measure where the gravi gravitational force is from something called gravitational lensing. That is, the light gets bent by the matter itself, and you can map out where the mass is. And most of the mass is where those purple things are. So we think what has happened is that two cl clusters, which had dark matter and ordinary matter, smashed into each other. The ordinary matter made pancakes, where the pink stuff was. The dark matter, not feeling any forces, shot right through and became those blue blobs. So this is, I think, the strongest evidence that dark matter is not just something wrong with our theory of gravity. It really is some kind of independent matter out there. Now, if we add up how much there is, there's still not enough to make the universe recollapse. It only gives us 25% of what we need, and that's not enough. So at that point, you could close the book and say, well, we've got ordinary matter, we've got dark matter, and um, the universe will expand forever. Uh, what is the dark matter? Well, uh, our best estimate is that it's a, probably a massive, undiscovered elementary particle that interacts very weakly with ordinary matter. Um, in, in some sense, this is a fancy way of saying that we don't know what it is. Um, we've got theories, of course, but this is the theoretical frontier at this point. This is where I have done some of my work and where people are working very furiously to try to understand what the dark matter really is made of. We don't know, but we, we do know it's there. Um, but wait, that's not all there is. So I said that we, would, you know, we don't have enough matter to close the universe, but, but there's more. And the reason that we can even talk about this is that a telescope can act as a time machine. So let me, um, I'm dating myself, but some of you have seen this show. Um, a telescope is a time machine. And the reason is, if I look out at the night sky and I look at a star that's 500 light years away, I'm not looking at what it looks like tonight. That light that left that star came, left 500 years ago. So I'm looking at what the, the sky looked like 500 years ago, where that star was 500 years ago. In fact, the picture you see of the night sky is a universe that never existed. You're looking at that star 100 years ago, that star 10 years ago, that star 1,000 years ago. They're all mushed together. Now, what would be nice is if we could actually look back and see how the universe was expanding in its early stages of evolution. That's not so easy because the universe is about 13.7 billion years old. So to see a significant fraction of that, um, you have to look back like a billion light years. The, the Hubble's measurements and most of the nearby galaxies we see are sort of millions of light years away. A million light years hardly counts at all when you're talking about a billion years. You can see a million years back, but not a billion years. But in 1998, two groups um, discovered a way to do this. And what they were looking at was a special kind of supernova. Now, supernovae are the brightest objects in the sky. And they tried to use supernovae the same way that Hubble used Cepheid variables, like standard candles. They could tell how far they really were away and how fast they were moving. And then they could see how fast the universe was expanding um, when it was a billion years ago. So here's a, here's a picture of different fates for the universe. Here's a universe that expands and recollapses. Here's a universe that expands forever. The blue one also expands forever. And the point here is our present day. Now, we'd like to look into the future, but that's impossible. But we can look into the past. We can measure how the universe was expanding when it was, say, at 10% of its current age. And then you could figure out which of these curves we lie on and extrapolate it forward. And the surprising thing is that we didn't lie on any of the yellow, green, or blue curves, which are the standard universe. We're on the red curve. That is to say, the universe was slowing down as it ought to, and now it looks like it's speeding up. So it's as though you threw an apple into the air. Let me see if this will work. You threw an apple into the air, and it slowed down as it ought to for a while. But then when it got a little bit above your hand, it suddenly accelerated. 
That's actually what the universe is doing. I mean, that looks ridiculous. And a lot of people think what the universe is doing looks ridiculous, but it's doing it. It slowed down early on, and now it's speeding up. It's actually accelerating. And that's something that um, a few people had kind of predicted in the 1990s, but most people thought that that was not the way the universe behaved. In order to make the universe accelerate now, we need something called dark energy. And dark energy has very weird properties, to, uh, as you can imagine, if you're going to make the universe accelerate. Um, let me give you, first of all, it has repulsive gravity. And that's, that's uh, what that means is people say, well, gravity only attracts, it never repels. Well, that's not quite true. In the universe as a whole, it's actually repelling now. It's actually pushing things farther apart faster than, um, than, than it is drawing them together. And it's the dark energy that's doing it. The ordinary matter wants to pull in and collapse, but the dark energy, which is the dominant energy in the universe now, is, is pushing the universe apart. Um, we also think that it doesn't get more dilute as the universe expands, and that's a really weird thing. So you can imagine the, you know, putting a, a, a box around a piece of the universe, and as the box expands in all directions, there's the same number of galaxies in the box, but the volume goes up, so the density of galaxies goes down, right? I mean, if you pump up a bicycle tire, the number of atoms in the tire stays the same, but the density goes down because the tire is getting bigger. Well, as the universe expands, the density of matter goes down, the density of radiation goes down, the density of everything goes down, except this stuff. It stays the same. Imagine you're pulling on a piece of taffy, and as you pull on the piece of taffy, more taffy gets created in the middle so that the, it doesn't get any thinner as you pull on it. That's what dark energy is doing. And that's very disturbing. If that doesn't disturb you, then I haven't explained it properly. All right. um, it doesn't cluster. That is to say, it seems to be smoothly distributed throughout the universe. The dark matter clusters. It, gives a, it, it sits in galaxy clusters, and it sits in galaxies. That, you know, it surrounds galaxies themselves. But the dark energy doesn't cluster at all. It's distributed evenly throughout the universe. And it probably, we think, only feels the force of gravity. It doesn't feel um, any other forces but gravity, which is, makes it very hard to study. Now, if we add together how much uh, of this stuff there is, we get the picture that I showed at the beginning. Most of the matter in the universe is in forms that are not what you're made out of. So you, you make up of only a very tiny, you're, you're, you know, ordinary hydrogen, helium, and all of chemistry, and all of biology, and everything we study in science um, only accounts for about 5% of the stuff in the universe. And about a quarter of it is dark matter, and about 70% is dark energy. Now. I think that this is kind of the picture where we were around the year 2000 or so, 2001. And it was becoming clearer, but a lot of people still thought this was kind of kooky, especially the dark energy part. And the, um, this, the, this picture of the universe was brilliantly confirmed in 2003 by the WMAP satellite, which is, this is a picture of the WMAP satellite. They announced their initial results in 2003. The results have all been getting better since then, and we've had other experiments since then. But what WMAP was measuring was the radiation left over from the Big Bang. This is the radiation that was discovered in 1965 by um, scientists at Bell Labs, and it really launched the renaissance of modern cosmology. And this radiation fills the universe at a temperature of about 3 degrees Kelvin, so it's very cold. And it looks pretty uniform. When, they, when it was discovered, they said, well, it's just a uniform haze of radiation. But in fact, it's not exactly uniform. It fluctuates up and down in intensity. And this is what the universe would look like if you could see in the microwave, which you can't, and if you got up above the Earth's atmosphere, uh, because the Earth blocks most of the microwave, and then you had to subtract off the galaxy, which makes a big, messy foreground in the front. This is what the universe would look like to you. And there are hot spots and there are cold spots. It fluctuates up and down. Now, the reason it fluctuates up and down is that we believe that in the early, early universe, there were little ripples in the density. The density of everything wasn't uniform. It was just fluctuating up and down here and there. And then as the universe expanded, those ripples grew under the influence of gravity. The high-density regions sucked in more matter, and the low-density regions had their matter sucked out of them. And so um, the, the, the um, more dense regions got more and more and more dense and ultimately produced galaxies and clusters of galaxies. And you can predict what kind of, th that, that process itself 
interacts with the radiation and leaves this ripple pattern in the radiation. And you can predict what the ripple pattern ought to look like. But it turns out that that prediction depends on what the universe is made of. So if you change the dark matter density, you get a slightly different picture. If you change the ordinary matter density, you get a very different picture. If you change the dark energy density, it has a smaller effect, but it still gives you a slightly different picture. And so what these scientists did is they looked at you know, this multidimensional space of all possible densities of dark matter and dark energy and, and ordinary matter and uh, various other things I haven't even talked about tonight. And they scanned through it until they found the model that best fits what they actually saw in the sky. And that model is, in fact, the one I showed you. It, it agrees perfectly with the picture we've presented so far. That is to say, if you want to see the microwave background as it appears in that photo I showed you, you need a universe that's about 70% dark energy, about 25% dark matter, and about 5% ordinary matter. So that's, that's the, you know, nobody is going to give out a, a Nobel Prize uh, until something has been confirmed. And in fact, the people who discovered the acceleration of the universe got their Nobel Prize, but they didn't get it until after this result got published. Okay? And nobody's going to, you shouldn't believe anything in science the first, you know, if you, when you see these science stories that appear in the newspaper about this new theory or that new discovery, don't believe it for at least five years. Put it away in your drawer, and, and, and if it still exists, if it's still true five years later, then you can believe it. Now, how are we going to find dark matter and dark energy? Um, what, what are we looking for and how are we going to see them? Well, the, dark, the search for dark matter really boils down to kind of a three-legged stool. There are three different probes that we're pursuing to see dark matter out there. Um, the first is the Large Hadron Collider in uh, Switzerland. The second are what, I, what are called direct detection experiments. And the third are astrophysical observations. And let me, let me talk about each of those in turn. So let's go to the Large Hadron Collider, and here we are at the Large Hadron Collider. This is the world's largest particle accelerator. There used to be multiple particle accelerators, but as they got bigger and bigger and bigger, you could only have one at a time. That's the biggest in the world. And right now, the biggest in the world is in Switzerland and the Swiss-French border. And what scientists do is they accelerate particles to very, very, very high energies. They smash them into each other, and they look at the debris. And the hope here is that if the dark matter particle is, in fact, a, a, an elementary particle, we might be able to create it at the Large Hadron Collider and, and measure its properties. Um, this would be the perfect scenario. This is like getting a butterfly and pinning it down to a, a piece of uh, a cardboard and looking at it through a, a magnifying glass. You could, we could, if we could discover the dark matter at the Large Hadron Collider, we would know everything about it in a fairly short amount of time. That's, the, that's kind of the dream scenario. The problem is that the Large Hadron Collider can only probe a certain range of masses and energies, and there's a cutoff. It can't get above about a, what's called a trillion electron volts, which is a, it, it's a, lot, of, a lot of mass, but it, we don't know for sure that the dark matter is, is down there. And so far, it has seen nothing. I mean, it hasn't seen nothing, but it hasn't seen the dark matter. So that is a depressing. Uh, not, most of us didn't expect that they necessarily would see the dark matter, but we were kind of hoping they would. Now, I think a, a, an experiment with better prospects are what are called direct searches. So in a direct search, you first of all go to find an abandoned mine. Uh, now, this is not a good experiment if you have claustrophobia or you're scared of the dark or you don't like to be underground. You find an abandoned mine. You go deep, 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 deep. But gold mines are especially good for this. But there's one in the, the old Homestake mine in South Dakota. There's one, actually, the railroad tunnel in Italy it, it Italian uh, Swiss border. Um, there, there are several others of these. And you go deep underground. And the reason you do that is you're trying to avoid cosmic rays, because cosmic rays are constantly hitting the Earth's surface, and they, you might mistake them for dark matter. And then you get a big vat of stuff. Okay? Now, it almost doesn't matter what your stuff is, as long as it's big and cheap. And lately, the, the uh, experiments have settled on liquid xenon. So, um, it's nice because xenon didn't really have much use except as a crossword puzzle answer before now. But now it's, it's, it's important because it's the main way we're looking for dark matter. So you put liquid xenon in this big vat. You not only have you know, uh, uh, about a mile of Earth to protect it, but then you put in other, other shields. So this has a layer of lead, then a later layer of um, radio clean lead. Lead is lead that doesn't have radioactive isotopes in it and then a layer of plastic, and then a layer of copper. 
And so you're really trying to isolate and make sure nothing hits your detector except dark matter. And the reason this works is that we think the dark matter interacts so weakly that it can just penetrate right through all this stuff. Okay? It can go through the earth, it can go through the lead, it can go through the copper until it gets to your tank of liquid xenon. Now you might ask, well, why doesn't it just go through the tank of liquid xenon? And the answer is it usually does, unfortunately. So the idea is, though, that you've, you've eliminated all these other particle backgrounds, and occasionally, maybe once or twice a month or once or twice a year, one of these dark matter particles is going to hit a liquid xenon atom and go ding and knock the liquid xenon atom over, and the electron will come out, and it'll be picked up on your detector. So the main key, key to these experiments is getting the background radiation down as low as you can get it down. They see signals, but all the signals they see are consistent with, with uh, cosmic rays and radioactive, ordinary radioactive background. They haven't seen anything above what they would expect to see if it was just ordinary radiation. So these experiments have not seen anything yet. But the really nice thing about them is that you can scale them up. So this is a picture of xenon, which, which xenon is this? Xenon 100. Xenon 100 has 100 kilograms, or about 200 pounds, of liquid xenon. It's not state of the art. Now they're working on xenon 1 ton. And xenon 1 ton has a, ton, a metric ton, or about 2,000 pounds of liquid xenon. And they're just going to keep going. All right, liquid xenon isn't that expensive, and it's easy to scale these up. They're just going to build bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger detectors till they see something. If I had to put my money on something, as the, the people who are going to actually discover dark matter, I would put it on these experiments. This would not surprise me at all if we opened the New York Times tomorrow and someone reported a discovery of dark matter in one of these experiments. Now, the third leg of our triad is astrophysical signals. And there's lots of these that you might have from dark matter. So you might imagine dark matter out in space annihilating with an anti-dark matter particle. It would give off a gamma ray. Or dark matter decaying. We don't know for sure that it's stable. We just know that it's stable on the lifetime of the universe kind of level, billions of years. It might give off a gamma ray. Or it might interact with, with ordinary matter and produce gamma rays or x-rays. So what people have done is they've launched gamma ray telescopes. Again, it's another thing where you really can't see this from the ground because the Earth's atmosphere blocks it. And, and in this case, it's a good thing. Um, but you can see gamma rays from outer space. Now, the problem with these experiments is not that we haven't seen anything, as in the first two cases. We've seen way too much. There's tons and tons and tons of signals and weird spikes and all sorts of things. And every time a new one is found, the cosmologists jump on it and say, it's dark matter. It has this mass. It has that mass. And in fact, they ha we haven't been able to rule out dark matter explanations for several different signals. Now, they're all giving contradictory predictions for the mass. There's a, you know, a signal over here, and a signal over here, and a signal over there. And astrophysics is really messy. Okay, real astrophysics, not cosmology, is a messy subject. And my hunch is that most or all of these signals are, in fact, just due to other astrophysical um, things like you know, gas interacting with a neutron star or strong magnetic fields accelerating particles. So this, these, in some sense, have been too successful. They've seen a lot of stuff, but I wouldn't put money on anything that they've seen. Now, what about dark energy? Um, there's no known way to directly detect dark energy. It probably only interacts um, gravitationally. And for that reason, um, it's not likely we're ever going to see it in a laboratory experiment, although people have made proposals for that. What, they want, what people want to do is try to develop better and better and better improvements on that very first observation of these distant supernovae. That is to say, to measure more and more and more supernovae and get a very accurate picture of how the universe has been expanding from its infancy up to the present. And the proposal uh, was to launch this thing called WFIRST, which stands for Wide Field, Wide Field Infrared Survey Telescope. So that's an infrared telescope. The light from these distant objects gets red shifted, so you see it better in the infrared than in visible light. And this thing was going to go out into space and map out all of these supernovae and, and give us a measure of how the universe is expanding. Now, unfortunately, this got zeroed out in the latest um, presidential budget. And I don't know if it's been put in yet um, in the latest budget that was passed. So this thing may never fly, or it may you know, be resurrected a year or two from now. But it's our best bet to discover um, what the dark energy is made of. So what is the bottom line here? 
I hope I've been able to convince you that um, really, I think for the first time in the history of cosmology, we know exactly what the universe is made of. Uh, it's made of dark matter, it's made of dark energy, and it's made of ordinary matter. And yet, we really don't know what it's made out of. In the sense that we have these names for things, we know their properties, we know how they have to behave uh, on large scales, but we really don't know the details. So this is really, as I said, a really fantastic, interesting time in cosmology, because uh, we have overwhelming evidence for the existence of these extra components, and yet there's still plenty of, of work to be done on understanding exactly what they're made of. And that's, that's mostly what I've been doing over the last few years, is trying to get a handle, especially on the dark energy, that's been my main research focus, uh, a little bit of dark matter and even a little bit of element production in the early universe. So um, that's all I have to say tonight. Thank you very much, and thank you, um, Dr. Donaldson, for endowing the lecture. And um, I think we have time for some questions.